there is, I believe, a notion um, amongst professing Christians today, at least in the West, and when I say West, I just sort of mean the kind of first world, Canada, uh, U.S., lots of Europe, Australia. Um, there is sort of this, oh, well, many affluent countries. Uh, there's this notion about f- their faith, and it's, it's merely in this Jesus I'm not saying it's a wrong Jesus, but this Jesus who has saved them from, you know, future wrath and hell, so they're going to go to heaven, so they, they, Jesus is their savior, and Jesus is also the one, like the Prince of Peace and everything, so he helps them when they are hurting. So when they are in a chaotic situation, okay, I'm going to go to Jesus because he's my peace, so then you get peace, and so it's sort of Jesus as savior from hell, and Jesus as giver of things when you need them. That's sort of a notion that I think, I could be wrong, but I think is potentially mainstream in in much of the Western church. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is giver. Let me say one thing. You might think I'm criticizing that, and I'm I'm not, because Jesus is our Savior, and Jesus does bestow many gifts. I mean, we've been through Ephesians, if you remember, and Ephesians chapter 1 is all about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, in Jesus. So he is our, and obviously he's our Savior um, as well. But I do think that this is sort of a a shrunken down mini Jesus. Um, It's it's a huge part of who he is, but if we just have that mentality only, then not only are we missing out, but I think we'll actually be tempted, without even knowing it, to sort of live kind of subpar beneath what God has actually called us to do. If we merely have Jesus in sort of this consumeristic sense, he's my savior, he's my giver, but I still have my life. And you know, I, I, I kind of hit on that a lot, because I see it in my heart, so, uh, and I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of popular as well, but there is so much more in Christ. In fact, I'm, in Colossians, Paul even says, in Christ are hidden all the, the riches of wisdom and knowledge. There, there's so much more in Jesus, so much more than just to sort of have him as, okay, he saved me from hell, he gives me things when I need them, and I just have my life. There's so much more And I want to bring us to one of those things, which I think is so, so, so essential. Way back 2,000 years ago, there was this young girl, we don't know her exact age, maybe 13, 14 years old, and she's in this town called Nazareth, all right? And uh, this angel shows up, Angel Gabriel, and it scares her to death. She is freaked out. You would be too, by the way. You'd be very scared when this angelic being dressed in white just appears before you especially being a young girl. This young girl, her name was Mary. She was engaged at the time. um, And she's scared. And and the angel Gabriel says this to her. Do not be afraid, Mary. Listen very closely to what he says to her. For you have found favor with God. And behold, so listen, Mary, 13-year-old, 14-year-old girl, listen, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now that's very interesting that the first thing Mary hears is not that Jesus is going to be the savior and giver, but he's going to be a king, right? Now I'm not saying that The angel doesn't say that Jesus will be Savior. He says that to Joseph. Call his name Jesus, right? Emmanuel, God with us. He will save their people from their sins. Very, very essential. But as we see here, the first thing that the angel Gabriel tells Mary is that in your womb, this Jesus is going to be a king. And he's going to sit on a throne that will never, ever end. So if Jesus, as Savior, saves us, and he does, hallelujah. If Jesus, as giver, gives to us, which is true, that's great, then Jesus is king, what then? He rules and he reigns over us, and he rules and he reigns through us. You see, I think we know well the gospel, the good news of salvation, the good news that God has saved us from Satan's sin and death, and that is amazing through the person and work of Jesus. Amen. But do we know well the gospel of the kingdom? The good news of God's reign, of God's authority through Jesus Christ in this world and in the world to come, because that's huge. When Jesus is doing his ministry, he tells his disciples, I must go to the other towns because I must preach the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom. Not just the good news of salvation, but the good news of the kingdom, 
which is so essential. You see, salvation gave us new birth. New birth is this reality that we talk about. We talk about being born again, but I don't, maybe not so much now, but I know that in the past, maybe in the 80s, the 90s, and into the millennium, um, it was sort of kind of like the word evangelical today. It's sort of being tied to politics and everything like that, so people don't like being tied because it's kind of become all political. And that th same thing kind of happened with being a born-again Christian, and we kind of lose what that means. But think about it. We have been born again. Two births going on here. Your physical birth, but you have in repenting and looking to Jesus and what he has done for you and believing upon what God has done through Jesus, you are born from above. The f God becomes your true father. You become a new creation in Christ. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, the old has passed away. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, look, the new has come, just like a new baby, which we're going to be experiencing very soon, right? New creation. This is exciting. Something has happened, being born again. So with that in mind, with this reality of being a new creation, being born again, second birth, consider what Jesus says here to a religious leader uh, in the dark in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus says, unless one is born again, which we could call the salvation element, you're not under your old man anymore, condemned to death, but you are in Christ, sealed, right? You're hidden in Christ with God, right? You're a new creation. So unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then again in verse 5, unless, he says, the sort of the, it's like a parallelism. It sort of says the same thing, but in different language. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So do you see how it's tied together? You can't take away salvation from the kingdom. They are intimately tied. Salvation is what causes you to be born again into the kingdom of God. God. So I think maybe sometimes we try to separate the two, and we sort of have our life when we think that we're saved from this and this, and Jesus gives us things, but we totally neglect the reality of the kingdom. And that's not to much of our fault. I think it's the way that it's kind of being thought about and, and talked about a lot. We, we miss out the element of the kingdom of God, what we are saved unto. You see, our being saved, our being born again, our being washed clean from impurity and given a new spirit, our salvation comes with a kingdom a kingdom that we can see, just like Jesus says, a kingdom that we can enter into now and forevermore. There is no such thing, I believe, as salvation from Jesus without the kingdom of Jesus. You can't have it. To be saved by King Jesus is to be necessarily transferred into his kingdom. And when we grasp that, then we, things will start to make more sense. Like when you read in Colossians 1.13, which I say all the time because it's such a great verse. God has delivered us from the domain of darkness. You could also say kingdom of darkness. And he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Right? Where there is redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There's that salvation aspect. But you see, even for Paul, the, the important thing is that God has taken us from the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness, and he's put us somewhere else in a new kingdom where there is this reality of salvation, which you have. Praise God. See how it's connected? Does that make sense? Or is that just me? You guys are getting it? It's so intimately connected. And notice as well, and let this just excite you, that Paul is not saying to the church, to us, God will deliver you from the domain of darkness and will eventually, at the end of time, transfer you to the kingdom of Jesus. It doesn't say that. This is in the past tense. Grammar is very important in the Bible. He has delivered us and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, which means we walk in and we see an already reality of the kingdom without forgetting the great consummation that will come. As one commentator wrote, this is very important because if we were in, sorry, before I say what he says, before we were in uh, the kingdom of God, we were in another kingdom, right? The domain of darkness. And Ephesians chapter 2 says that in that place, we followed the prince of the ruler of the air. We followed him without even realizing it. In, f in fact, in 1 John chapter 5, it says that the ruler of this world is the enemy, the, king, the, the devil. So one commentator wrote, writes this, changing lordship or changing kingship, which happens in salvation, means changing kingdoms. When you change a lordship, you change kingdoms. Just like Brittany and I were listening to the scripture this morning in Hebrews. When you change a priesthood, a, pr a priest, you have a new 
law. <laughs> you have a new reality, a new covenant that comes with a different priest. And there has been a change in priesthood where it's not the Levites anymore. It's now Jesus Christ is our great high priest. So if you are a genuine disciple of Jesus, then you just, just get excited. You can shout right now if you want to, uh, that you are in a new kingdom, whole new kingdom, right? The kingdom of God. And here's what one uh, 20th century preacher had to say about this. Um, he says this. This is Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, who preached in Westminster Chapel in London for many years. He says, the first thing you have to realize about yourself, and he's speaking to Christians, the first thing you have to realize about yourself is that you belong to a different kingdom. Isn't that fascinating? It's the first thing you've got to realize about yourself. Not just, oh, you're saved and, and Jesus is with you and then walk away. He's like, the first thing you've got to realize coming to salvation is that you belong to a different kingdom. You are, not, he goes on, you are not only different in essence in this kingdom, you are living in two absolutely different worlds. You are in this world, but you are not of it. You are among those other people, yes, but you are citizens of another kingdom. So incredibly important. You are of God's kingdom, church, which does not find its source, its power, its structure, its authority, its provision, and its life from the world. And yet, we keep going to the world for those things. Jesus said to Pilate, the Roman governor who gave him up to basically to what the Jews wanted out of fear, right? Um, and Pilate will be judged for this gave him up to crucifixion. And Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Again, re-emphasizing that Jesus is, not only is Jesus claiming that he is king, right? My kingdom, notice that, my kingdom. He owns it. God the Father has given it to Jesus. My kingdom is not of this world. Again, the source, the power, the authority, everything does not come from this world. It comes from me, God. See, discipleship, I believe, discipleship, which is, again, this reality of us following Jesus as his disciples. He's our rabbi, our leader, our teacher, our imitator, and we, we imitate him, right? He's our model. That's what discipleship is. We follow him. Discipleship is all to do with how we can live in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Jesus, while surrounded by the kingdom of darkness. So discipleship, while we are on this world until we die or before Jesus comes back, is that's what it's about. How do we continue to follow Jesus, who's currently not here in physical form? How do we follow him in this world where we're surrounded by darkness and yet we are in a new kingdom? In fact, it says that we are seated with him in the heavenlies. How do we live like that? That's a very important question. It is the question of discipleship. All of this sets up sets us up to better grasp and apply our passage today. So, very, very brief context of our passage. Jesus, remember, he has his little crew. Well, it's actually not little. It's, he has his 12 apostles, but he also has a, a crew of other disciples that are kind of a mixture of those really committed, those not really committed, and Jesus kind of goes through sifting, you know. When he sees too much, he's scared of too much. It's kind of flipped around today in modern church. We want more and more and more, where Jesus is like, I want less and less and less people, because he knows that so much of it is just, it's not true. It's not real, genuine. Um, but anyways, Jesus and his little crew are making their way to Jerusalem. Jesus knows, and he's been telling his apostles and his disciples, I'm going to go and I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And they have no idea what he's talking about, because in their mind, the king, the Messiah of the Jews, that's not what the Messiah does. He doesn't die. That doesn't make any sense. But he goes to Jerusalem. They're all kind of, you know, humming and hawing about it a little bit. But on their way, they get to this place, and there's this massive crowd. You can remember this. And actually, look in the beginning of chapter 12. You can see, in the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together, that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples. Now, I, I encouraged us two weeks ago to really get that image in your mind, because sometimes when we read the parables and the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, we can imagine it being something like this. You know, it's a nice, and, and the pictures show it too. He's just sitting on a rock, and there's just a few people, and they're like this, and like listening to Jesus, and he's like this. I'm sure some of them were like that, but some of it was like this loud, chaotic, many thousands of people, people trampling other people, and Jesus is like, okay, where's my disciples at? Okay, I got something to say to you. Like, it was crazy sometimes. And this is the kind of the atmosphere where our passage is going to be in. So notice that context. Lots going on. And, and I said two weeks ago, this is sort of a metaphorical, figurative way to speak of just <sighs> there's so much worldliness and craziness going around us, but we need to fix our eyes upon what Jesus says. Because it'd be really easy for us just to see people getting trampled and everything and get so distracted. 
whereas Jesus' voice, we need to hear it in the midst of the distractions. So I think that's important to kind of realize. But that's the context, the historical context of our passage today. And he's been speaking to his disciples. We heard two weeks ago that he's been talking to them about allegiance to him. Don't fear the world, okay? Follow me, pledge your allegiance to me and me alone. Because if you don't pledge your allegiance to me now be publicly before men, then I'm not going to affirm you and confirm you into the kingdom on the day when I return. Like powerful stuff that he's been saying to his disciples in this chapter. And then you have this guy that kind of yells out in greed and selfishness saying, hey, Jesus, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. That leads Jesus into explaining and talking a little bit about possessions and material things on this world. And he gives this parable. And you'll remember the parable, there's this rich man who does really well. And that's not the problem, okay? That's not the problem. A man did well. His, his farm went great. That's not very good agricultural language, but it did well, okay? And, but what does he do? He takes it all upon himself. This is all mine. We went through all the different the pronouns of I, me, my. This is all my stuff. I'm going to build storehouses so I can store up all my stuff. My, my, mine. He builds these barns and then he sits and relaxes and he tells his soul. He tells himself. He's like, ah, you can relax. You're secure. You've got everything you need. All your provision is found because I did it, you know? And what happens there? He's called a fool because that very night, God says, your life is required of you. And whose stuff is this going to be? All of your energy put into all this stuff does nothing for your soul because your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Nothing. So you're a fool, <laughs> right? And then Jesus finishes in verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself here on earth and yet is not rich toward God. They're just focused on storing up, being secure in this world, making sure every, their, their, their accounts are full, all that kind of stuff, but they're not rich toward God. And it's immediately after this that Jesus then begins uh, speaking to his disciples. And he talks more about possessions, materials, anxiety about it. And I just believe that there's no better text to preach than this one in our world today when the economy is so shaky and there's inflation and there's all this different stuff. We need to hear this because this is so incredibly practical in our time right now. So we're going to go through our passage in three parts. First part, verses 22, 23. Let me read it. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. So therefore, that's important, right? So he's just talked about this parable of this rich man and storing up all this stuff, and if you don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth, be rich toward God. Therefore... Okay, so the fool is the one who lays up treasure for himself but isn't rich toward God. But therefore, listen, do not be anxious because the disciples might be thinking, but Jesus, we live in crazy times. Like, we need to have food. We need to eat. We need to do these things. And obviously, this, this man, he, he, in our, our eyes, he did a good thing. He's storing up. He's preparing for himself. He's, he's very wise. I mean, he's preparing for the, for the famine. Like, look at him. He's, he's doing a good work. And yet, Jesus calls him a fool. So Jesus wants to better explain this so that he helps his disciples recognize how do we think about these sort of things and how do we not work ourselves up. So do not be anxious. And that's a very key word in this passage. Do not be anxious. This word in the Greek is to expend careful thought. So I, I think that's interesting. It's not necessarily because sometimes we put negativity towards anxiety and, and things like that. And obviously that's, that's a, a, a true. But to understand it is just expending careful thought. You can... You can do that without thinking of yourself as anxious. You can just be thinking. You're, you're focused on it. You're, you're even, maybe you're not stressed about it, but you're just expending very careful thought on it. That's what the kind of the root word means here. So I think that's just important that we don't just think, because if we say ang anxiety, some people will automatically think, oh, that's not me. But all they do is think about how they can make more money, <laughs> expending careful thought. So think about that a little bit. So this is to be overly concerned, overly concerned. But what about, right, what about what you eat and what you wear? Don't, Jesus is saying, do not be overly concerned about these physical things that you need. Things like eating food, right? Things like putting on clothes. These are important um, realities. And Jesus immediately gives them a reason for why. You look at verse 23. He says, for, right, so he tells them, do not do this. Why? Because, verse 23, your life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Now, 
certainly eat food. I hope you do. And wear clothing, please. Okay? These are important things to do, but there's so much more to your life than this. And you know this intuitively. I know that you do. Your life is so much more than just being this garburator that just eats up everything. And your life, obviously, your body is way more than just be sort of being a mannequin to display clothes. Like, so much more. And I think also we can uh, stretch this a little bit just to include other earthly kind of necessity things that sometimes we can be overly concerned about and we can expend careful thought on things like shelter, things like our homes, savings, our transportation, our careers, these sort of things that are not wrong, they're important. And we need to put some thought towards them, but we can expend so much thought and worry and concern into those things. Life is not merely about eating, putting on clothes, having a home, having a car, doing these things, and yet we can easily fall into this thinking. We become overly concerned about it all, and we start to live, even though we wouldn't think it, we start to live as if our bodies and our lives, this is all what it's about, just preserving yourself and sustaining yourself for the future, just like the rich man, the fool, right, who just stored everything up so he could relax, he's secure, he's provided for himself, he's done. But there's so much more to this rich man's life than that. And there's so much more to your life than just eating, putting on clothes, having a home, having a car, having a good saving. So, as kingdom citizens, how do we fight the temptation to be anxious and overly concerned about these things? Jesus gives us five ways, which leads us into our second part. We're just hammering through here, which is great. Okay, this is verses 24 through 30, and we'll take it each as five ways to to fight this temptation. So, let's read verse 24. Consider the ravens. I just can imagine the the disciples at this point saying, Jesus, what are you talking about? Like, birds have nothing to do with this conversation, right? Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? The first way that we can fight temptation to be anxious about these things is to know that God will feed us. Now, ravens, okay, to the Jewish ears of the disciples and others, they would have heard the word ravens and been like, oh, unclean, because they were. And the Torah, the law, they were unclean birds. They're not that desirable. They were not that valuable. It's kind of like crows today. I don't think any of you are going to go outside and be like, oh, look, a crow, look, take a picture, take a selfie near it. Like, this is amazing, a crow. We get annoyed at crows, right? They're always picking apart animals. They're gross. They're dirty. They're in the gutters, picking the garbage. They're just, they're not that desirable, not that valuable in our perspective. I know they're part of the circle of life. I understand. But, Jesus says, consider them. Consider them. It's like, okay, I guess I'll consider the raven. I'll consider the crow. I'll consider them. And what's his main point here? Jesus is saying, look, these crows are not going down to, you know, Bank of Montreal and opening up different accounts and putting in investments. They're not making sure that they have all their T's in a row when it comes to storing up They're not getting all the toilet paper because of something happening right in the world. They're not doing this, and yet, look, they're being fed. Look at them. We don't just see starving crows everywhere. I don't know, when was the last time you saw a crow, like, uh, uh, like starving? I haven't, ever. You don't see it, because somehow, some way, they get fed. And what we see, what Jesus says, is like, God, God feeds them. And here's this kind of striking point to his disciples. Look, look, if God personally, if God personally, that's what it says, God feeds them, right? That's what we read that. If God personally feeds even these undesirable, dirty, dumpster-eating ravens and birds, how much more is he going to care for you? If he cares for these little ravens on the ground, how much more will he care for you? Especially being in the kingdom of God, being his son or his daughter. Uh, He will care for you. Listen, God's love and his care for you is way more than you can even fathom. Whatever you thought about your God's love for you is that times a million. That's how much he cares for you. That's how much he loves for you. I love Romans 8, 29, when Paul writes that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for you. Just think about that for a moment, okay? God did not spare his own son, his own one and only son, Sometimes Brittany and I have thought about this, like with our our boy and our girl and our future girl coming. But just for the imagery of this, thinking of a son, like I think of my boy Adonai, and I love my son. Like I really, really love Ado. I hope you do too. He just smiles and waves. 
And yes, he can be terror sometimes, but I love him so much. And I just, the thought of me sacrificing his life for someone that hates me, like that just, that's hard. It doesn't make any sense in the world's eyes. And yet that's exactly what the father did. He did not spare his own son whom he loved from eternity past to eternity future, but gave him up for us ungodly, weak sinners that spit in his face. That's crazy. And that's why, that's the demonstration of his love for us, that he gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's why. But to continue on in that verse, if God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he, the Father, not now, in Christ, give us what? Everything. All things. If God gave up his own son for you, then he's going to give you everything that you need. You don't need to worry. Don't be anxious. He already gave you life by giving his, the life of his son away so you can have life. He's going to give you everything that you need. You do not need to worry at all. At all. Psalm 81, verse 10. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. If we took that verse and translated it into like a new covenant reality, we, could, we would read this. I'm the Lord your God who, Isaac, gave up my son for you and saved you from Satan's sin and death. So open your mouth wide, Isaac. I will fill it. And that same thing can be said for you. That's the first reason. Second reason, this is in verses 25 through 26. Let's read this. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? So the second way that we can fight anxiety, or the temptation to be anxious, is to know, know that anxiety does nothing for you. Absolutely diddly squat for you. It does nothing. Being overly concerned about worldly things, like you know, food, clothing, shelter, these kind of things, does nothing. And notice, even in verse uh, twenty. Uh, five, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour? So you can see Jesus emphasizing the single hour. He's not talking about loss, just one little tiny hour to your life. Being overly concerned does nothing, even that much. It can't do it. So Jesus' argument then is in verse 26, if you're not able to do a small thing is add one hour to your span of life, then why would you think that being anxious could do anything else for you? If it can't do this tiny little thing, why do you think it would help you in any other way? It's, it's, he's making a great argument here. Let God care for you. If he saved you, church, from Satan, sin, and death, he can provide everything that you need. So as Peter writes, receive this today, okay? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. So you can cast your anxieties on him. Come to him. He's ready for that. He's ready for that. And for you to truly do it. Like, go to him and do this today on your own time. Go to him and just cast all your anxieties on him. Everything. And he cares for you. And he will exalt you in the proper time. He will lift you up. The third way that we can fight temptation to be anxious is in verses 27 to 28. Consider the lilies. How they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? So the third way is this. Know that God is going to clothe you. I mean, they'll just kind of come together. He's going to care for you. That's basically it. See, the flowers in the fields, like the ravens, are less valuable compared to who we are as those made in his image and his likeness. Now, this isn't to devalue ravens or to devalue flowers and the fields and nature, but, or creation, but I think we know from Genesis 1 that God specially made us and he cares for us. And I hope all of you would rather save a soul than save a tree. I hope so. It's very important. Um, soul will go on forever. So like the ravens, the flowers aren't overly concerned about dressing themselves, right? They're not going down to, I don't know why Reitman's came into my, my brain, but any, think of any clothing shop. It's not even there anymore. But um, there weren't even guys' clothes there. Maybe my mom went there a lot or something, but 
You don't see flowers getting up and, uh, and going. In fact, I think in our Jesus Storybook Bible, there's a really funny picture when they're talking about this for kids to know. They have the flower with a person going into like a grocery store to go and get clothes, right? You don't see flowers doing this. They're not toiling, they're not spinning, they're not sewing, you know, spinning thread together. And yet look what God does to flowers. Talk to someone like Anne or Kent about it because they'll tell you what God can do. What God can do. And, and what's amazing is that even though flowers and, 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 and ravens and all these things are less, I, I want to make sure I use this word properly. I, I want you to know that I really do respect God's creation, absolutely. But they, in compared to who we are, made in his image and his likeness, there is a difference. But look, I mean, flowers captivate mankind. They just do. There's a huge business for it because all of us, no matter, every single spring when they come, we're captivated once again. Oh, <gasps> look. We get excited. I mean, look at, I mean, I mean, like, come on, Kent and Anne. You've seen what a rose looks like. Why are you so excited? Yeah, right? You've seen what those look like. Why do we have to be so fascinated? But we are. I mean, look how beautiful these are. Look at them. It's amazing, right? We get so captivated by them. I mean, there's, God dresses them so, in such a, a, just a majestic way. And then Jesus even throws in Solomon. He's the richest man in the world wealthiest, most prominent. I mean, his kingdom of Israel was just amazing. And he was arrayed in such nice clothing as the king of Israel. At the height of Israel's, like, perfection, you could say. And yet, I mean, Solomon's got nothing on these, right? That's Jesus' point. I mean, look at Solomon. Sure, he was nice, but look at these. You can't explain the wonder of these flowers. So, in verse 28... If God so clothes the grass, which is alive today and gone tomorrow. I mean, I just threw out the ones that were here from a week ago, and they were all dried up, and they were dead. If he can clothe them here today, and yet tomorrow they're gone, how much more is he going to clothe you, who's not just here today and gone tomorrow? You're actually here forever. How much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? God is going to clothe you. He is going to take care of you. And I want us to see here, too, that Jesus unveils, almost in an indirect way, the root of anxiety and the root of over-concernedness. And what is it? Unbelief. Faithlessness. Oh, you of little faith. You're not believing in my care, my provision, and that's why you're so anxious. You think that it's all about you, and you need to make sure that you get everything together in your life. And that's why you're anxious. And what does that mean? What does that tell me? I'm, I'm speaking as God. What does that tell me? It tells me that you don't actually believe that I'm your caregiver. You're telling me that I'm not your provider, but that you're the provider. Oh, you of little faith, believe me. Trust in me. And I, I've said this before, but I believe trusting God, even more than loving God, I mean, you can't really separate the two, but I believe that trusting God is the way that we most glorify God. And the way that we, uh, we scorn God is by not trusting in him. I've talked about it like even with my wife and I. If there was a day that she came up to me and said, Isaac, I don't trust you. That would hurt way more than her getting up one morning and saying, oh, I don't really have butterflies for you today. I would say, that's fine, me neither. And then, you know, we just go on and we just, I'm kidding. Uh, no, but if she says to me like, look, Isaac, I just don't trust you. That would, that would, that would stab me in a way that would hurt so much more than her just saying, oh, I'm just, you know, or whatever. Anything else. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you don't trust someone. Oh. And we do that. We do that with God all the time. And it hurts him. Right? He gr grieves. That's what happens. All right. Now, here's a quick side note, because I think this is important that we address this. We could read this. His consider the ravens, consider the lilies, right? Ravens, they're not working. The flowers, they're not working, and yet they're getting what they need. Therefore, oh, we don't have to work. We're going to have everything that we need. No. This is not written to rate lazy people, okay? This is written to anxious people. That's the context. He's not writing to the lazy ones. He's writing to the anxious ones. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Okay? If you actually go through the New Testament, you see Paul's words. I mean, they're strong when it comes to supporting yourself and supporting those around you, right? It's, it's so, it's so uh, prevalent in there. God gifts us with work as a means for receiving our necessities. 
even, and I'll, to prove this, before the fall happened, this is in Genesis 1 and 2, before the fall happened, when sin came in and everything got cursed, before the fall hap- happened, Adam was commanded to work, to work for his food, to work the garden, to keep it, to work it, from which his food would come. That's really important that we understand that. And when you read in Genesis 2, it, it kind of shows an uncultivated land, right? There was nothing that really sprung up yet. You read it. Nothing really sprung up yet. There was a dew kind of on the ground. And then God places Adam to work it, to keep it, right? To produce food. So work is not bad. It's good. It's actually a gift that God gives us to support what we a lot of times need. So work is essential. So don't hear this. I'm just going to be like a raven and a flower. I'm just going to sit back, relax. And no, work, okay? If you're not willing to work, don't eat. Number four. Know that being anxious about and seeking for worldly things is an unbeliever's trait. It's the characteristic of an unbeliever. Look at verses 29 to the beginning of verse 30. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. So he's kind of just reemphasizing what he's already said. For, so here's the reason, all the nations of the world seek after these things. Just stop there. So Jesus shows us that being anxious leads to seeking these necessities, right? So don't be anxious, don't be seeking these things. If we're anxious about these things, that's where we're going to be expending our careful thoughts. How do I get them? I'm going to be seeking all these things all the time, things for the world to help me, my body, to eat, to clothe, to shelter, to transportation, to blah, 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 all of these things. And Jesus sums up what he said at the beginning, like I already said, and the reason why he says, do not be worried, do not seek after these things out of this anxious heart, because that's what everyone else does. Now, we might think about that and be like, well, how is that an argument? Why is that, why is that important that we not be like them? The whole gospel is about God setting us apart, right? We're called saints, holy ones. The word holy means set apart. The whole point of what God did for us is to take us away from the Satan-ruled, sin-entrenched, and death reality world take us away from that so that we don't have to live in its horror anymore and we can live in his kingdom so yes it's important that we not be like the rest of the world anxiety and worry to be overly concerned about these worldly things these are worldly traits that characterize those in the kingdom of darkness to characterize all of the nations and to follow suit with them is to live in line with them but god calls us out from among them. I'm going to read a passage from 2 Corinthians, which makes this so clear, but just listen, okay? Uh, This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We, he's speaking to us, okay? We are the temple of the living God. As God said, and then Paul goes into these promises from the Old Testament that apply to us. I love this. God says this, I will make my dwelling among them, us, and I will walk among them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. Be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since, then then Paul synthesizes this, he sums it up, since we have these promises, beloved ones, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, and you can include here, and anxiety over these worldly things, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God, bringing your set-apartedness to completion in the Lord. Do you see this? Get out from among them. Now, that does not mean we just go live in monasteries way up in the north somewhere. Let's just be separate from them and just leave them. No, what's more powerful and what God wants us to do is live in the midst of this world and yet separated from the world. And this is how holiness preaches to the world without even saying anything is living the way that God wants us to live in the midst of those that are not living that way. And that's how we can shine the light of Jesus to the world um, around us. So to go on in this hyper concertedness about worldly matters, what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to, where I'm going to live and all these kind of things is to remain unseparated from, which means connected to, right? The world. Thereby you're not living out the promises of God's kingdom. All that God did for you, you're just like, cool, I've been transferred in this kingdom, but I'm just going to stay over here. It's like, no. Hebrews 9.28 says that Christ is coming again to finally and fully save those who are 
eagerly waiting for him. This eagerness is related to anxiousness, right? When God comes back, he's, Jesus comes back, he wants to see those who are anxious about him, right? He's coming back for those that are eagerly waiting for him, that are expending careful thought about him coming back, about those who are overly concerned and obsessed with his return. Not those who are like, I need new pants, right? And I need more food. He's looking for these ones. So you can see the swapping and anxiety. Maybe some of you just need to switch your anxiety today and your worry to something else, to Jesus. Number five, remember these are five ways that, um, I know this is like part five of the point two and whatever. You don't really, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> the fifth way that we can fight temptation to be anxious is to this, know that God knows what you need. Okay, verse 31, half of verse 31 says, uh, sorry, 30, and your father knows that you need them, and the them there is referring specifically to the eat, what, you know, food and, and clothing, but it can be added on to anything that you need for life, okay? The unbelievers anxiously seek after these things because they believe that they're in control. We talked about this already, but we don't have to do that. We know that we're not in control. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that I'm not in control. We can happily sit in the back seat, and that's okay, okay? Jesus is in control. God is in control, and he knows everything that we need. And talking about prayer, Jesus asks, or says the same thing in Matthew 6, 8, your father knows what you need before you ask him, so you don't need to go on and speak go crazy in all your prayers. Just come before him and say, God, you know everything that I need. Please supply all my needs, and God's like, I know exactly what you need, and I will supply all of your needs. Okay, part number three, verses 31 through 34. This finishes it up. Instead, okay, so don't be anxious. Instead, Christianity and your faith is not just about not doing certain things. It's about doing certain things, right? Flee all these things, but pursue this, right? So don't be anxious, but pursue, okay? So sometimes we have this mentality that our faith in Jesus, our Christianity is about just not doing all these things. And our efforts are just put towards not doing this, not doing this, not doing this. And yet we just feel so discouraged and depressed because we haven't done any of the insteads, <laughs> any of the pursues. So we're kind of in this weird space. But anyways, and that's how the world sees it. The world, the world just thinks Christianity is about just not doing a whole bunch of things. We've got to show them that it's about doing a lot of things, and it's awesome. Okay, so instead, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags, like wallets, purses, that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, Knowing the five truths that we just talked about, the five ways, right? Know that he will care for you, feed you, know that anxiety gives you nothing, so on and so forth. Knowing those things are going to help us in, in fighting temptation. But what Jesus says in verse 31 is the overarching way that keeps us content. If anything, get this. In the midst of trial, understand, above all, seek God's kingdom. Seek that. Don't seek food, seek God's kingdom. Don't seek clothing, seek God's kingdom. Don't seek a house, seek God's kingdom. Above all, seek God's kingdom. What does this mean? God's kingdom is what he has saved us for, what he has saved us into, a new kingdom. It's his already not yet reality. It's his rule of righteousness and peace and power. His provision, his source of life is the kingdom of God, and that's what he has saved us for. God's kingdom is a totally different system than the kingdoms of this world. As we heard Martin Lloyd-Jones say, right? Different sphere altogether, a totally different world. And in seeking God's kingdom first, which is how Matthew puts it, in seeking God's kingdom first, you are living in accord with God and what he has done in Christ the King. You're just living along with it. In fact, when you seek God's kingdom first, you are proving your faith in Jesus, right? You're proving it. It's like the whole faith without works is dead, right? We talked about that. When you live and you seek God's kingdom first, you are basically walking out what you've confessed with your lips, that Jesus is Lord. If you say Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is king, seeking first his kingdom is the proof that you do believe that he is king and that he is Lord. Now, God's kingdom in a very basic sense is his rule and his reign, but I was, 
I was uh, taught this past week by an author who said that we can't, the moment that we sort of define something, it, we can be tempted to kind of grasp it and we get it and it's done. It's like, okay, I've understood it and this is for us in the West. I've understood it, I understand the definition, so therefore I've mastered it. But we can't do that. It's like trying to define God. You can't. You can't define his kingdom. So yes, when I say it's his rule and his reign, that's true, but there's so much more to that. I mean, we're talking about the son of God, the, one, the eternal one, immortal, invisible, God only wise, who dwells in unapproachable light. This is his kingdom. I mean, so much more than just defining it, this little thing. But just to give us some context, we're talking about his rule, his reign, his kingdom, his dominion, okay? And that's amazing. To prioritize his kingdom is to prioritize then and seek after and be worried about, be anxious for the things of God, to be anxious about his values, his truths, and so on. It brings to mind Mark 8, 33, when when Jesus tells his disciples, like, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. And then Peter, who thinks he's being all heroic, is saying, mm, not so. You know, that's not going to happen to you because you're the Messiah and you're going to conquer. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. And what does Jesus say to Peter? He says, you are not setting your things on the things of God, but you're setting your mind. So setting your things. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but you're setting your mind on the things of man, the things on this earth. But you need to be setting your mind on the things above, on the things of God where God is, where the kingdom is. And we don't have to fear, as Jesus says. Fear not, guys. Don't fear. Our Father has joyfully given us his kingdom of provision, of life, of power. Everything we need, and most importantly, what we need for our souls, is met in his kingdom. Everything. Don't fear. You can so confidently walk in his kingdom, surrounded by everything that's going on today, and be totally okay. It's amazing. Now watch what Jesus does here. I love this. Verse 33. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. The treasure in the heavens where nothing can affect it. I love this. When we're living in God's kingdom, seeking it first, experiencing God's provision for us, we are free to be free with everything. Isn't that amazing? I love it. I mean, God's our father. He's our king. We're in his kingdom. We're his kids, right? He feeds us. He clothes us. He sustains us. He didn't spare his own son for us. He's going to give us everything. Therefore, church, be free. Isaac, be free. I can be totally free from anxiety, and I can be free to be free with everything that I have. Not just free from anxiety, but free from stuff. And I love it. Jesus' application here is like, so guys, he, 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 basically Jesus is saying, to understand, to, to help me know that you get, get what I'm saying here, sell your possessions and give it away. Then you'll understand. Then I know that you've understood what I'm saying here. Don't you love it? We, we don't understand this, but in living in a consumeristic world, like we've been taught from a little early age to, to hoard and to get more, and we find value in that and identity in that, and yet Jesus breaks that down and says, look, you don't understand, but that is a trap. It is a trap, and it'll kill you. You'll drown in it, but be free. When you seek first God's kingdom, you could be freed, totally free, and free to give. So do you see how we're different from the world? The world is anxious about acquiring, right, stuff, because they think that life consists in the stuff, and yet we're free to totally freely distribute anything that we get, right? That widow that went up to the temple, she had, what was it, one penny or two pennies? Anyone remember? I don't remember. Two? Thanks, Colin. She had two pennies. And she put it into the box there. And then you had others there that were giving, like, you know, their, you know, thousands of pennies, right? Because that was their tithe. And what did Jesus say to his disciples? He says, this widow gave more than all of them. Because she gave all that she had. She, she got it. She understood it. She understood it. So we get it when we start to get rid of all that we have. Jesus encourages us to look from our physical wallets where we can put so much time, so much energy, so much anxiety into our purses, our wallets, our bank accounts. He wants us to start thinking about heavenly wallets, heavenly purses, heavenly storehouses. Not like the rich fool who built a real storehouse where he, you know, he opened up more storage lockers down on first down there for all of his stuff, but storage lockers in heaven. He wants us to start focusing on that because up there, there ain't going to be any moths putting moth holes in your clothing like they do in our closet all the time, right? There's not going to be thieves that are going to be able to break in and, and steal what you have 
up there. One New Testament scholar writes this about storing up treasures in heaven. He says, it refers to whatever is, of, whatever is of good and eternal significance that comes out of what is done on earth. Doing righteous deeds, suffering for Christ's sake, forgiving one another. All of these have the promise of reward. Other deeds of kindness also store up treasure in heaven, including willingness to share. So basically, when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, which is the correlating passage to our passage in Luke, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is, as we begin to live righteously and start to give away and be generous and forgive one another and be free with our stuff, these storehouses just start piling up with treasure. So much treasure. It's awesome. So focusing on seeking and doing righteousness in God's kingdom while on earth is providing ourselves with money bags, wallets, purses, storage lockers that do not grow old, that will not fail, no one can steal. Then Jesus adds this very powerful statement at the end, verse 34, which many of you heard if you've been in the church for a while, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, if all of our energy and time is put toward earthly and worldly things like storing up treasures on earth, then that proves where our real devotion is. Right? But if it's switched, if all of our time and energy is put towards seeking first his kingdom, it's about filling the storage locker of heaven, then we know that our heart and our devotion is up with God and not here on earth. So, above all, church, seek God's kingdom. And you won't only be free from anxiety and worry about worldly things, which would be awesome for some of us, right? but you'll be filled with joy, you'll be filled with generosity, and you'd be, you'll be free to be free. Seeking God's kingdom means living in the knowledge that God's going to take care of your physical needs because you're more valuable to God as his creation, as his son or daughter, redeemed by Jesus than anything else in all creation. Seeking God's kingdom means living in the knowledge that anxiety about worldly things can produce nothing of importance but only destruction and decay and ulcers and death. Seeking God's kingdom means living in the knowledge that we as God's people are different from the world. We've been pulled out of the world, separated from the world. We are living in an entirely different kingdom, a different realm, different sphere of life altogether, where God's righteousness, peace, and joy abound, even in the midst of worldly trial and temptation. We sang the song, It Is Well, today, and my brother Richard reminded me on Wednesday about the author of that song, It Is Well, where his wife and his girls were in a shipwreck when they were crossing the Atlantic, and they all died. And then he takes the same ship, well, not the same ship, but a different ship, over, and when he's in the same area in the ocean where they had drowned, he writes the song. Even in the midst of these billows and trial and temptations, he can say, it is well with my soul, because I'm in God's kingdom. I've been saved. Christ has regarded my, my sinful estate and has bled, shed his own blood for my soul. I am saved in his kingdom. So despite the trials, and that's a heavy trial, and you've gone through heavy trials, just like he did. Horatio Spafford, I think his name was. In the midst of those trials, in the billows of the world, we can be content and joy because we are in the kingdom of God. You are in and you are of God's kingdom, church, which does not find its source, power, structure, provision, and authority in life from the world, but from God in heaven. So as disciples, let us remember that God has saved us abundantly in Christ, not just from sin, but for a kingdom. May we not just be Christians that believe in Jesus as Savior, Jesus as Giver, but also as Jesus as King. And we are in His kingdom. Follow Christ, your King, and be free from anxiety about worldly things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this word. And Lord, I know that we are living in a time that um, this is very prevalent, Lord, and I know there might even be people here. I even think of my life and Brittany's, our physical kind of life, Lord, and there's so much uncertainty when it comes to the economy. There's so much realities going on, Lord, and it can be really unnerving for many of us, Lord. And what a passage to bring us to this morning, Father, for you to speak so clearly to say, Isaac, church, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't worry about all this stuff. When you do that, you're just living like the world, but seek first the kingdom that I shed my blood for you to enter into. Seek first that kingdom where you will be overly uh, given everything that you need. Everything that you need will be found in me. Father, I also pray that those of us maybe who don't have much, those of us that do have a lot in worldly terms, some of us like the rich man in the passage before, but some of us like the widow. Lord, I pray that from the widow to that rich man, we would be free to give everything away. 
Lord, I pray that right now for everyone here, that we would not set our hope on riches that we might have or not have, but we would just be able to give freely and be content with what God has given us and give away everything else. Father, I pray that you would help us do this. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.